All right, so um, after the buildup, this will hopefully be um, everything that you all expected and more. Um, over the last hour and a half, I've worked very diligently on it, off and on. So uh, what I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit today about is it's motivation, but it's specifically the part of motivation that everybody really cares about. It's like when you're not motivated, but you're really supposed to be doing something. Um, so I'll give you just a little bit of information about me. Uh, I'm a Rails developer. My brother and I have uh, our own small business. Um, you can hit me up via email. I don't do social media. Uh, intermittently, people like hearing about psycho like psychological stuff. Uh, so feel free to drop me a message if anything's really interesting and you'd like more information about it. I'll be happy to, to uh, get back to you. And then, yeah, my what makes me somewhat, um, you know, proficient speaking about this is the fact that I have a master's in applied positive psychology, um, which I got in London, which is a lovely place. Any of you guys have the opportunity to go. So now, here's the disclaimer: um, we're only talking about intrinsic motivation, and so there are other ways of getting to do the things that you want to do. Um, so, for example, uh, if you guys want to do heroin, uh, you're going to get a lot of positive affect. Positive affect is kind of a fancy word for emotions, positive emotions, which are normally tied to, um, you know, biochemicals like dopamine and serotonin. Uh, for a little bit more educated discussion of emotions and how they can help you do things, you can look up, uh, her name's Barbara Fredrickson. And uh, she has this theory that's called broaden and build, which is essentially like you build up this sense of positive emotions and then you use that to form a positive upward spiral that helps you do other things. Um, there's another type of, it's, it's not an emotion, but it's more of like an experience that's called flow. It's become like a really popular term in, in pop culture. Uh, Zeke Sent Mahili is the guy who kind of formulated that model. And flow is, it's kind of the notion of being uh, lost in a timeless, uh, very uh, fulfilling, but almost like out of body type of experience. So you kind of lose track of yourself, you lose track of your surroundings. You're totally engaged in this activity. You love it. Um, you wouldn't even say that you're loving it because you're not thinking about how you're feeling. You're totally absorbed in the activity. Uh, so some examples of flow would be like if you're surfing and you love surfing and you are uh, you know, typically doing something that's a little bit challenging that requires your total focus, so maybe like big wave, big wave surfing. Or if you're playing chess and you have to maintain other focus, or if you're like us and you're coding. Um, you know, and you just kind of lose track of time, you're enjoying what you're working on, et cetera, that's flow. Um, so those are two other ways of kind of building motivation to do things, um, but that's not what we're talking about today. So what we are talking about is really when you need to do something you hate, and instead you do a bunch of other stuff. Now, when I say you need to do something you hate, you know like cognitively that it's important. So like, let's say that you have a job and you like keeping your job and you know that if you don't do tasks A, B, and C, your ass is gonna get canned. But if you have just like the slightest amount of like independence, you are going to avoid doing A, B, and C. Um, that's the problem that we're talking about today. Um, and so, you know, why do I need to know this? Because you lazy. At least I'm lazy. But you don't like the consequences of being lazy. So you like having your own business. I do, because I get like to be in charge, which is fun. People don't tell me what to do, mostly. Uh, but if I just do what I want all the time, then we're going to go bro you know, broke. I'm not going to have my own business. So one way of like reasoning about this or kind of addressing the inherent uh, difficulties associated with free will. Um, are these, it's these three components. So um, competence, basically being skilled. And it's by task, it's not in general. 
because nobody is competent in general overall. I can refer you, or I could refer you to a few public figures. Um, I could refer you to a few more public figures. The more you learn about somebody, you're going to realize that that person is really good at certain things and really not good at other things, myself included. So remember, when we're, when we're kind of like thinking about self-determination theory, we're thinking about it in the context of a task or the um, activity at hand. And then relevance, again, with regards to that task, so me writing the copy for our website. You know, is it related to some values that I hold? And these are like very basic thoughts. If anybody has watched Inception, this is the third level. Right, yeah, it's three levels. So, and then the last thing, autonomy. Um, it is independence. In its like purest form, autonomy for this model is you're not thinking about it, you just would do it. All right, so keep that in mind. And now, some more caveats. Um, in the real world, few things really exist. So we're really talking about perceived competence, autonomy, and relevance. And that's important because we're going to talk a little bit about self-determination theory and building motivation for yourselves. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, how you can work with others to build that for them. And so your perception of another's competence is not the same as that individual's. So anyone want to take a guess at this one? Yeah, I forgot this the first time I made the slide. So it's a situation in which internal motivation is high. <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, so like giving this talk and, you know, You'll see at the bottom. Uh, but competence is, is considered high by me. Again, it's perceived competence. Uh, because like this was something that I studied for a while. You know, I get a master's in it. I like it, right? Uh, the relevance for me personally, I think to myself, well, you know, hey, maybe I'll give this again. So it like fits with like a career goal or, or something that I have. And then secondly, it like makes me feel pro-social. It's like, oh, I'm being nice. I'm giving back to the community. Oh, people might like this. And then uh, autonomy at the bottom, you know, I get to make slides with a bunch of uh, acronyms on them. So. so what we're really talking about is, you know, tasks that we avoid, that we want to be able to do. Um, and so when it comes back to our, our issue, and in case anyone's want, run, or wondering, yes, I really do not want to write copy for our website. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't choose it. Uh, it is relevant to me. It's relevant to a business goal. But again, I have low motivation to do this because of these two other factors. So, you know, competence, autonomy, and relevance are the three uh, legs of this stool, in a sense. And if one is missing, like, it's pretty easy for, you know, me to kind of fall over and have no uh, motivation whatsoever for these. So, you know, in the short term, uh, I can't necessarily build the, the, the thing that I'm missing. So in other words, I haven't written a bunch of, of uh, you know, website copy, text pieces, lauding the exploits of our, or the, not exploits, but the uh, accomplishments of our company. So like, you know, it's not easy for me to do. Uh, I'm not, my background's not in marketing. So, but what I can do is I can try to build the other two. And with autonomy, no, I wouldn't normally choose to do that. If you gave me a thousand things, I would never, ever choose to, I mean, write copy for our website. I would literally choose all 999 every time. But if I think about it not globally as a task, but small elements of it, so like, all right, I'm going to get to be snarky. I can put in some like, uh, you know, inside jokes, um, things like that. I can make it, I can take ownership of the project in small ways. And then again, focusing on like the values that, that do matter to me will hopefully uh, help build, you know, the requisite uh, momentum to get this done. 
So for the longer term solution though, I probably want to address that missing component. And the missing component for me in this case would be competence. And for us, because we're in a skilled-based profession, competence is going to come up for a lot of things, whether it's a new technology, or it's the first time you're writing a feature on your own, or you're writing a code review and you've never reviewed anybody else's code, so you don't really know what comments to leave that would be useful, and oh my god, you just want to fix the code, but like, yeah. So the way that you can build it is with practice, but you can also find an external support for competence. So somebody else who's going to give you some positive feedback along the way, who's going to take the like fear of failure uh, off your chest, or who's going to help segment what is maybe a big task into smaller tasks. Anybody? What about working with others? So the, the, the steps that you would take for this, if you're working with others, like, in, part of my job is, is having people that I manage. And so when I'm managing them, if I'm doing a good job, I'm thinking about each new project or assignment that we're working on, and I'm, I'm evaluating those three components. So like, how skilled is this person at the thing that I'm asking her or him to do? You know, does this person, uh, you know, really want to do it? Like if I, is this person asking? If the person knew about the project, would they want to do it without me, you know, delegating or giving it to them? And then thirdly, like, does this person feel that it is relevant what we're doing to, to herself or himself? And then, you know, sometimes people are going to get stuff they don't like. So you do want to build up, like, the, you want to take the strengths that are present and pump those up. A lot of times we, we've, management and, and the way that organizations are, have been structured a lot of it is deficiency based. You find a deficiency, you work on the deficiency. And that's the way that like the education system is for the most part set up. So if you have like an A in math, an A in English, but you have like an F in Spanish, it's like, well, geez, we better get your Spanish grade up. In general, that's pretty demotivating. So like the whole field of positive psychology really is about taking people's strengths expanding upon those and then using that kind of upward swing to, to address deficiencies. Like my experience, there is no sh more surefire way to like destroy somebody's confidence than to just have them focus on the things that they're bad at. Um, now, like a pretty good way of getting people, you know, willing to take risks um, to, you know, try a new technology uh, to you know, write the copy for uh, you know some new uh, project or program is is to like build them up in an, in an kind of an almost an unrelated area, and so the uh, strategies that are listed here at the bottom concern if we like here if you have low competence if, if someone's if not particularly skilled in what you're doing then you want to like meet with them frequently. And you want to kind of laud their successes, even the small ones along the way. Um, if the person doesn't feel that it's relevant, me personally, like I'll usually talk to our employees because like it should be relevant. And if it's not, it's probably like there was a conversation that was missed, or maybe the task that we're talking about is dumb. Um, and then finally, and this is difficult with like people who are really new. But you do want to try to find even the smallest opportunities for people to make choices. Even if it's just like the shade or the opacity of a button, um, you know, whatever. So some interesting kind of things that come out of this, and again, this is an intrinsic or internal motivation. Money is actually not a good way of building someone's internal motivation. Now remember, there are other types of motivation. So money is like a great way of building external motivation. But when you measure like P 
people's job satisfactions and, and they're in fields that are really heavily tied to bonuses, they tend to not feel a very high sense of autonomy because they feel, a lot of people do, that they are being pushed to meet particular goals or that they're only doing an activity because of a monetary benefit. Now, I talked to our employees about this and I was like, yo, hey, so does this mean that you guys don't get paid anymore? And unfortunately, no, that's not the case. Um, competition. Again, in certain, like in controlled settings, competition can be really helpful for bringing out the best in people. Um, but whenever there's a winner, there's also normally a loser. And if that's the way a competition is set up, uh, that can be pretty demotivating. Again, because people feel manipulated. And then, you know, it's a, our third point here, people who are being micromanaged are going to feel a lack of autonomy. That's pretty obvious. But the caveat to that is, especially if, if you, know, you find yourself in a new role as a manager, you're probably going to undermanage instead. So what you might want to be doing as a new manager is instead like focusing on having frequent check-ins and then giving people uh, positive feedback and finding small opportunities for them to uh, make decisions. So, you know, when it comes to like the practical steps that you can take to kind of, you know, you recognize that you have encountered a task that you're not particularly inclined uh, to complete. You can reflect on these things that we've talked about. Um, one specific way of doing that is by thinking to a point in the future, typically you know, a year, two years, five years, at the end of your life, it could be. So if we're thinking about this moment, this ideal future, and we think about the action that we're being asked to, to complete now, it's easy to build a sense of relevance that way if it truly is like a necessary step towards you know this life that you'd like to have uh so you know maybe i want to have this like extraordinary uh you know committed relationship with person x and like if i focus on that and i realize that like watching game of thrones all the time or whatever is not really contributing to that it's going to be a little bit easier for me to drop it and then lastly, positive feedback doesn't just need to come from others. Um, it's nice when it does, but you can't really make other people do stuff, uh, I've found. So you can give it to yourself, which takes some practice, um, or you can structure it via a checklist. Um, I think Asana used to have like a shooting unicorn that would go across the screen intermittently when you mark something as being done, um, which is also cool. So, but that is, I guess that's your primer on self-determination theory and, and internal motivation. So I'll open it up for questions if anybody has any. Is there any intersection or compatibility with like, just sidestepping motivation and cultivating discipline? It's difficult for me sometimes to come up with intrinsic motivation to do a task. So my wife and I, when I just decide this is something that has to be done, come up with ways to just make myself do it, to discipline myself to do it, rather than find motivations. So the notion of discipline is like, for the longest time, motivation was researched within the general field. Of, it's called like self-regulation. Um, and you can certainly build discipline uh, separately. Um, so like ways of building self-discipline would be uh, meditation. Uh, not just like I sit around and I think about stuff, but I sit around and I get used to identifying my thoughts and then over time I develop the ability to decenter from my thoughts. Um, and in that way I can recognize that I don't like something, but that that kind of impulse of dislike doesn't really have much effect on me. Uh, so that would be one way um, of building self-regulation. Um, other people, people use, a lot of times people build quote unquote self-regulation through external mechanisms though. Uh, so in other words, like I ask my boss to meet with me every Tuesday at 8 a.m. to review my code from the day before because then I know I have to have it done. Um, so, 
I mean, this is like in a little bit separate vein, but yeah, there's definitely ways of doing that. And if you wanted to look it up, it would be self-regulation is like, for the most part, uh, what the literature would be, would appear under. Anybody else got any? Yeah, how do these ideas connect to like flow and the other thoughts that, you know, it seems like, although we weren't talking about the first slide, um, these things build to that, like they allow you to get to that state? They actually, so flow is a, it's a really interesting field of study. The way, where the field stands now is like some people are more inclined to it than others. Some activities are more likely to generate flow than others. Uh, there are probably certain activities that are not very conducive to ever being in a state of flow. Um, so if you are, having a conversation with somebody else, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to find yourself in a state of flow because it would be pretty easy for the other person to interrupt you at any time. Um, I mean, that's just an example, but uh, if you're looking at like generally building a sense of positive like well-being or positive mental health, uh, there's a good model that's called PERMA, which is uh, positive emotions, so that's positive affect, uh, engagement, which is another term for flow, relationships, meaning, and accomplishments. Um, so you can try to like organize a really well-rounded life by focusing, it, focusing on those five components. Um, but yeah, the scope of today was really just to talk about like Yo, how do I do this shit I hate doing? Um, and there's going to be stuff like that. You can't love doing everything. That's just not a... I mean, if you found the way, a solution to that, that would be, like, incredible. So, but you can, coming back to your question from earlier, you can certainly, like, lessen the sting of, of uh, how much you dislike something. So. Did you... Um Share some examples of like how or and when you would give yourself positive feedback. Yeah, so let's say that you, a lot of, I think a lot of people who do this successfully will set up an external structure like a journal or, you know, a time when they speak with a designated person. And if you have like a set, a series of, of structured questions like, what did I do well today? What am I proud of? What challenges did I overcome? The, and you do that, let's say like, has anybody here heard of like uh, gratitude journals? It's really popular, right? The caveat to gratitude journals is you reach a saturation point. So if you do it every day, it's probably not gonna make you feel very good. You do it once a week, Shit's probably looking pretty good. In general, like, the more acute your sense of, like, low competency or low autonomy or whatever, the more you probably need to intervene with yourself. So let's say that I'm new at my job. Uh, I am really struggling to find anything that I feel I'm doing particularly well at. I might every day at lunch and every day when I get home just force myself to write down two or three things that I did well. Um, now coming back to uh, the gentleman Green's question earlier like about uh, building self-regulation there's a separate benefit to meditation it's like you as you learn to identify your thoughts like if I say yo everybody think about monkey penises right now no, seriously, think about monkey penises. Chimpanzee monkey penises. You may have fought off the first attempt, but like at some point, you probably had that thought. And again, that shows up in Inception as well. They're talking about like pink elephants in the room. Uh, but the point is like you don't really control the thoughts that come into your head because you don't really control the stimuli. And your brain works way faster than your consciousness. So if you, sh if you hook up like an MRI, you're going to have emotions before you have cognitive thoughts. So the point is like, you know, positive feedback, et cetera, you're really like reassuring yourself after the fact and you want to structure it. And you're going to make yourself sit down and write two or three things that you did well, even though you might not feel that way. 
and you know like my general I would say like fuck your feelings I mean that's what I would say in the beginning you just have to accept that like you don't control them eventually if you meditate if you do things like this you're gonna get them in check but like in the beginning it's like you're a runaway freight train you're not gonna feel a particular way but you go through the steps over time you'll you'll gain a sense of, of both self-regulation and, and uh, emotional control. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Or did I talk long enough that you just <laughs> surrender? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> I knew I was one or the other was going to happen. So, uh, Any other questions? No? Did, did the chimpanzee penis like dry up those? <laughs> All right, cool. All right, well then, hey, thanks everybody, and uh, if you do have anything, feel free to drop me an email.